as we were kind of approaching the house, they were dragging Lieutenant Marshall up the side of the house. And again, still not knowing how seriously injury he injured he was, they kind of put him basically on the front corner of the house. And uh, he sort of looks up, looks like he's going to try to say something, and then just a large amount of blood comes out of his mouth. And as I try to look in his mouth, I just couldn't see anything. Again, it's still dark. We're doing it with like rifle flashlights. So we made an incision, put a tube in, started breathing for him. Within the police department, you know, obviously our big question was how do we keep the department functioning? If you know we had an entire station taken out with people who had COVID, you know, that would be devastating. So how do we decide you know we also can't isolate a hundred percent from everything um, so how do we kind of find a balance to allow people to work and yet try to protect them and keep them safe and so pretty early on I was getting called so I got a notification that there were multiple officers shot downtown there was a park kind of across from a parking garage where they thought he was in. Uh, I saw some officers kind of huddled behind a car, so I pulled up there, got my gear out. That's when I was, I don't remember if it was on the radio or how I heard that he was in the El Centro College. So I uh, kind of made my way that direction. You're listening to the ATO Bridge and Need Divide podcast. Brought to you by the Assist the Officer Foundation. Since 1999, the ATO has given assistance to the first responder community. And now we want to give them a platform to hear their incredible stories. We also want to hear the stories of the many people that support us. Our community is small, but it is strong. We have differences. We don't always agree. And we all make mistakes. But together we can grow. We can heal. And we can learn from those mistakes. And together we can bridge the divide. Welcome back, ATO listeners. Joe and I are at the microphones today featuring a different aspect of public service. Same vitality, same driven mindset, observation, reason, human understanding, courage, but a lot more educated. What about the servitude performed in a white coat? Physicians have such an immense responsibility to treat suffering humanity. We have an exceptional white coat sitting here today. He wears it with dignity, pride, and shocking humility. You may have seen him donning his tactical gear in response to a barricaded person or a hostage rescue. He dually serves as a Dallas SWAT physician for the past 17 years. He grew up in the Mojave Desert, earned the honor of Eagle Scout, and graduated from the UCLA School of Medicine. Here in Dallas, he has battled Ebola, COVID, and treated so many critically injured officers. He's an expert in emergency medicine, a dedicated instructor, a father, and a pillar of public service. ATO, please welcome one of our very own, Dr. Jeffrey Metzger. Thank you. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, um, you see why it's hard to get that out sometimes when you're sitting across from somebody. Yeah. It's well-deserved, and it's an honor to sit with you. Uh, it's honor is definitely mine. So I first have to ask, what's it like growing up in the desert? Uh, I loved it. Yeah? It's a really small town. Uh, actually, third largest city in California land-wise, but 2,400 people. Oh, wow. Lots of dirt bike riding. and. So did you grow up riding dirt bikes? I did. Very cool. Yes. So what was your first dirt bike? Uh, it was a little Honda 80. Or no, I was a 50. And your parents yeah. were okay with that? My So my dad always rode, uh, okay. so he was all for it. My mom was much less excited about it. 
Are you from educated parents? Uh, I'm not. My dad worked in an open pit mine, and my mom had a couple jobs working for the school, working for the city. So were you smart growing up, like in high school? Was Did it come naturally for you? Uh, it probably came more natural than most. Yeah? Uh, I feel like a lot of it is probably more that I enjoyed it. So to kind of put my head down and do that work was probably a lot easier than if it was less enjoyable. You became an Eagle Scout in, uh, making pizzas. That... Yes. Yeah. Did you ever imagine you'd be a, a lifesaver as an adult while you were making those pizzas? No. <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, you know, especially coming from a small town, it's not what a lot of us did. Yeah, you know, I think there were four of my graduating class that went to a four-year university. That's amazing. Out of high school. And yet, and yet here you are in the big city of Dallas. What's your uh, favorite pizza to make? <laughs> uh, just a pepperoni, because that was probably one of the easiest. Sounds delicious. <laughs> You went to UC Riverside. Yes. And majored in biomedical sciences. Yes. Wow. Wow. So did you struggle? Any cl any classes that just you really struggled with? Uh, so never been a good writer. So okay. like the English classes were definitely most difficult. Uh, a lot of the biochemistry, organic chemistry, that stuff. That, that's Again, crazy. I think I enjoyed it more, so... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I want. I just want you to know how dumb I feel sitting here no. <laughs> and listen. My, you're, I'm gonna go into deep hypnosis because <laughs> my mind can't comprehend this. Anyway, yeah. sorry. Did you go to uh, UCLA and then Duke? Yes. Okay, so t tell us about medical school at UCLA. So it so the program I was in was, I mean, it was a accelerated program that you start from high school. Okay. And so they basically accept 300 people into this program. Uh, very kind of competitive. You take a high class load with a lot of classes like chemistry, organic chemistry, that kind of stuff. Um, and then after about the first year, that gets cut in half uh, because either you don't have the grades or you decide it's not for you. Um, after the second year, again, it gets cut in half. And then after the third year, they pick 24 to kind of continue on with the medical school phase. Wow. Uh, and so my, technically my last year of college was also my first year of medical school, which was kind of how it shaved off a year of sort of the normal process. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. I, I can't even. Did, when did you decide that you wanted to get into medical school? When you wanted to go that route? So I was always kind of interested in medicine, medical stuff, first aid, uh, probably, you know, since probably fifth grade. Really? That early on? You and There's a lot of people that, I'm going to be a doctor when I grow up. I'm going to be, my daughter, she's eight right now. She's saying she's going to be a veterinarian, you know, it, it's, but to be that young and to have an interest in something and to fulfill it and just, and, and, and stick with it because... <laughs> I've never been to this kind of schooling, but I'm guess I'm guessing it's pretty tough and and, and time consuming and and you're a super intelligent guy, so it's probably easier for you than others. But still, it's a grind, right? Yeah, uh, I think kind of thinking back on sort of how I started getting interested, I very distinctly remember this deal in the fifth grade where we had these cards and we checked our blood types. Okay. And we kind of learned about what it was. And I started learning like the body wasn't just a big mix of goo, that there were organs that did stuff. And I think the machine. that's, yeah, exactly. And I think that's what sort of piqued my interest. Uh, never really, I mean, I wasn't sure that I was going to go that route. I wasn't sure that that was even going to be doable kind of uh, growing up in a small town how I would compete with people who went to these massive schools with all these resources. Well, that makes it more impressive, actually. Yeah, it does. Well, you know? And I've had the, privi the privilege of seeing him work under pressure. <laughs> and, I mean, just calm, cool, collective. Did you ever have to save anybody when you were a lifeguard? 
Uh, yeah, not like really not doing CPR or anything, but getting in the water and yeah, you've had, pulling you people made a out. save. Tell oh, us yeah. about it. Uh, I mean, it's would happen fairly regularly that kids would swim out in the deep end and kind of figure out that they can't touch and panic or decide to go down the slide, really not being able to to swim and you know they just start going under. But does that feeling early on when you were younger relate to some of the things that you do now on a whole different level as far as saving a life? Yeah, probably. That's probably part of kind of what's driven my career. Yeah. I've always kind of thought maybe I have like a hero complex. And that's what led me to go into emergency medicine. Or probably what led me to lifeguard, what led me to go into, her- into emergency medicine, let me, led me to go into the law enforcement side. As- aspiring to be, you know, to be a hero, that's that's not a bad thing and then carrying it out and just fulfilling your dreams i mean and you were it's like you were two uh you have two capes right you're you have a law enforcement side and also a medical doctor side and you've utilized both why in the field under fire did it ever cross your mind did you ever have a fleeting thought that you might want to go into law enforcement the, stri- um, the strictly law enforcement. So, was interested. My brother was a police explorer scout. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of when we were teenagers, I was an EMS explorer scout. Can you uh, explain to the listener what that is? So, it's sort of a uh, kind of a branch of boy scouting where they uh, expose the kids, I mean, it's under 18, to a different career field. So it's a lot of ride-alongs. It's for the the program that we had, uh, the Explorer Scouts would sometimes help out with traffic control. They'd get a, a uniform and um, be able to go out on, on ride-outs with the officers and just get an idea of what law enforcement and EMS was all about. What year was that? 1994, 95. Okay. You know, I'm a big believer in the Explorer program. We have it here in Dallas PD, and it's a, they do a fantastic job. And I, I really think that that's so important, getting some of these young minds, because every young mind has a point in their life where they can go either way, whether they hate the cops or they listen to another relative or a friend or they have a bad ex- experience with law enforcement or uh, any first responder. And... I believe that the Explorer program really helps young minds understand this profession more. And I, th- I think a lot of the people that became went into the Explorer program have a better understanding and appreciation for law enforcement. And I'm glad I, I love that program. Yeah, yeah, I think it's awesome. So you came to Dallas 2005. Yes. Yep. And it was on a fellowship, right? Yes. So I understand it is the Government Emergency hmm. Medical, sec- is it Security Services? Security Services, yes. Okay, so tell us <laughs> what a fellowship is, because for our listeners, they may not know. Sure. I don't think I know. So the way uh, physician training goes is you get an undergrad degree, you get a medical degree, you do a residency, which is where you kind of hone your specialty. So okay. when you graduate with an MD, it's sort of a general medical degree Uh, and then you do residency which is where you specialize in things like internal medicine uh, emergency medicine family medicine OBGYN kind of whatever you want your specialty to be after that if you want to kind of subspecialize then you do a fellowship and that's where like you would go from uh, orthopedics to hand surgery or you would go from general surgery to uh some other special like vascular surgery or something like that. What's your specialty? So my specialty is emergency medicine. Okay. My subspecialty is really uh, kind of technically EMS and law enforcement medicine. So that's what my fellowship was. The uh, whole fellowship was basically had three parts. It had EMS, it had disaster medicine, and tactical medicine. 
Okay. And we would get an exposure to all three of those areas and basically focus on one. And obviously my focus was on the tactical medicine side. And so you came to us on our SWAT team, was it 2005? Yes. Now, did you have to go through basic SWAT? Yes. Do, do you remember that? I very much remember that. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, that's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, even though I was a lot younger than I am now, I mean, I certainly didn't have the physical fitness that a lot of the people on the SWAT team did. Um, and so that was, I'm like, say I was just, it was tough. It was eye opening, um, but it was incredible. I mean, a lot of stuff that people just don't know and never get to see and amazing. I mean, really kind of amazing how sort of academic and intelligent SWAT has to be. Who were some of the main players over there when you got into SWAT and you went through the, uh, to the SWAT schools? So, uh, I was there when A&E was doing our filming. Um, so it was a lot of Claggett and, uh, certainly Hack, Seibel. Okay. Uh, yeah, they, they're listeners and I wanted to, uh, <laughs> I, wanted, and I was talking to Claggett actually yesterday that you were coming on. He was all excited to hear, hear this episode. I said, you're going to have to wait a little bit, bro, but it's going to yeah. be good. So, so did they, did they outfit you in gear or did you have to provide your own gear? So they hooked me up with gear, uh, radio, helmet, vest. Uh, we got a lot of our medical gear from Dallas Fire Rescue. Okay. And it was bare bones, right? Like, I mean, you started this this project. So really, uh, so Alex Eastman came on a year before I did. Okay. Uh, and he and Bobby Owens really sort of laid the groundwork. Uh, and then I came on a year later and... Because I think most teams have paramedics as their their responders on their teams, and we were one of the first. And correct me if I'm wrong, in the country to have actual physicians as, as part of our team. Yes. Can you explain the difference, like for the listener, like what a, a, a tactical doctor as opposed to just a, a paramedic? What, what what the difference is? Because sure. I don't know myself. Really. Sure. So uh, certainly, the most teams use paramedics to kind of do the frontline medical support and a lot of that is because the type of medicine that needs to be done on that front lines isn't surgery you know it's not very high-end medicine not the same stuff that we would do in an emergency department it's very quick immediate life-saving measures stopping bleeding one of the biggest things uh, and then evacuating them out to a safer area and providing the rest of the care so a lot of that care can very adequately be done by paramedics. It's done all the time across the country. You know, lots of lives saved uh, because of paramedics who are out there doing this. Uh, sometimes they get advanced training in things like uh, surgical airways, uh, things that may, they may not otherwise be doing out on the streets. Uh, but it's a another model. It's one that we hadn't ever really chosen to go here in Dallas uh, for, I think, a lot of different reasons. Um, part of it is, you know, we sort of serve as a training site for physicians that are going to go out and provide medical direction for paramedics okay. in other locations. And so part of our mindset is we want to give these physicians a frontline view of kind of what's happening you know what happens at the the point of injury it's like field basically field triage is, is what you're it yeah it could turn certainly into at some point in an active situation yep so for the listeners out there you worked your your required shift in the er correct and then would come out here on your <laughs> on t own time and be a part of our team in full gear just like us in the apc is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And were you paid extra to do that? No. So you were pretty much volunteering your skills and your time to make our team better and safer, right? Yes, you could say <laughs> that. 
we just want you to know that we appreciate you and, <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, your that's... sacrifices. It's... I mean, it's like I said, it's it's been an incredible experience uh, and worth every second of it. And we threw you in the fire quick because you came in 2005, and then 2006, our team was running a warrant on Oak Park, and that was a early morning federal warrant, knock and announce, and um, suspect fired out the door and, and hit one mm-hmm. of our guys that was um, trying to pry the door. Is that correct? So yes. tell me your side of, of that and how that went down. Sure. So I was on the back side of the house uh, and heard shots fired, um, heard shots fired come over the radio, uh, heard that there was an officer injured, and then one of the officers on the D side of the house, the, the side of the house, uh, they had told me that there was an injured officer over there. So uh, I left the APC, kind of went to the side of the house, took care of the officer that was injured, had a gunshot wound to his arm. Um, I believe he was also hit in the chest uh, and uh, started taking care of him. What officer was that? Uh, that was Adolfo. Yeah, okay. Sergeant Adolfo Perez, and he wasn't a sergeant at the time. Yes. Yeah. But he, he went up to the door to because the, the door had a cage on it, and he had the pry in his hands. Yes. And as he went to pry the door, the suspect fired out the door and, and hit him in the arm while he yeah. was holding the pry. I remember yes. the damage with the pry. Yeah. And um, when you got to him, and correct me if I'm wrong, did, did he have some blood coming out of yeah. his mouth? So – Initially, on the side of the house, no. Uh, he uh, actually, I believe it was Randy Lancaster, was starting to bandage him. Uh, and so I went up to him, kind of looked at his wound, uh, finished with the bandage. What and, did you see as far as, can you describe the wound, what you saw when you first came up? It was just a through and through through his forearm. Okay. That's, that's that's just old hat to him. Yeah, that's just old yeah. hat. Yeah. Just yeah. through and just, through. Just, just like through and through. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You have to say it with the accent. It's just a flesh wound. <laughs> just a flesh wound. Uh, and so we pulled the APC up to the corner so that we could evacuate him out to the perimeter. Uh, and when we got him to the perimeter in a safer space, he started coughing up some blood. And what were your initial thoughts when you saw that? Uh, that he probably had some lung injury. And so did you go to work right then? So, yeah, you know, making sure that he had good air movement, looking for a wound, seeing if he actually had a wound going through his chest, uh, examining his arm, making sh- seeing if he had any arterial injury or uh, obvious nerve damage from that wound. Uh, and then we had DFR come up to the perimeter, and we loaded him up, and we went to the hospital. Where did you do? Where were you doing all this? Was it the side of the house, or, or is it uh, the front it? of the house? The front of the house. So okay. picked him up on the side of the house, and then we evacuated him to the front. And down the what was going on as this was happening? Uh, did you did you realize that other that officers got had been hit? So I knew there was at least one other officer that was injured that my partner, Doctor Eastman, was taking care of. Okay. Uh, uh, who who was he working on? So he was working on Dale Hackbarth. Okay. Yep. And, and so so Dale was hit in he was hamstring hit, area, hit in the leg. Yeah. Yep. By friendly fire on this, but we didn't know it at the time. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we just, all I knew was certainly a lot of gunfire it sounded like in both directions, but he was the only other one hit that I knew of at that time. Shout out to Dale. What amazing recovery. Yeah. He's yeah. Incredible He's awesome. He's always been a huge supporter of the program, even before that in, that incident. But so, it really is now. He's awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, what other off, What other SWAT operator got got uh, injuries from this so chuck del tufo mm-hmm. had a shrapnel wound to the ear um i think initially he wasn't sure i, I believe he had thought he was kind of struck in the head mm-hmm. uh, but it looked like it was a just an ear injury uh and then uh, another officer with a gunshot wound to the finger okay I actually spoke to Chuck yesterday. He's excited. Yes. He's a, he's a, he's a listener. Shout out Chuck. Awesome. He yeah, he's excited uh, uh he has some questions for, for okay. you. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. He want he he asked, "Did you realize how many officers were were wounded at the time you were you were wor- initially working on the on the first one?" No, definitely not. In fact, I think it was probably in the ambulance when I was communicating with Alex uh, that I first heard that there was more than just the two of them. 
could you hear shots being ringing out when you were at the scene? Yes, definitely. Okay. And there was, so there was the, the initial shot, uh, a couple other shots that I didn't know which direction, whether they were coming from inside the house or outside the house. Uh, and then went to a gas plan. So kind of hearing those rounds going in as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Chuck said there was gas being pumped in on the Delta side uh, while this was going on. And, and Misty, can you describe it? Just how hectic of a scene this is a, because you've been on BPs, you've been shot at several times. And when it's this active of a scene, it's this hot, you got people down. Can you just kind of describe for the listener just how chaotic when all the auditory, since everything goes to shit. This is when you depend on your senior guys. So Tim Houston stepped up and fired rounds into yep. the door frame to, to get our guys off the X and safe behind mm-hmm. APC. And, um, and he was thinking ahead of the game. And so that safely got Adolfo off the X and um, our slammer, some of our team back behind the APC. So that's when you depend on your senior guys to really react react, yeah. and, and, and look to them. Because I was new at that time, too. I, I had only, um, I'd only been there three years. And so you depend on them to make the decisions for you on, 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 on what to do. And that's, and that's why it's so um, impressive to me because this is one of his first in the field. I know that you've been in the, the ER, but sure. would you say it's different in the field? Oh, no doubt. And so yes. t- tell us why. So it's, you know, in the, in the emergency room, it's a very confined space with lots of bright lights and relative safety. Whereas outside of a dope house with people shooting back and forth and starting to pump gas and, um, you know, dim lights and you, you only have the equipment that you have with you, it's uh, entirely different. It's not a controlled environment. Not in the least. No. Yeah, this is one of those warrants that was right at daybreak. Yes. It was early, oh. early morning warrant. And um, and, the, and to this day, there's still a lot of controversy on those early morning warrants yes. and waking people up out of bed and. Yeah. When when you when you when you got to Adolfo, when did you realize that or determine if he was shot or not in the chest? Like how did you did you did y'all strip off his gear? How did you find that out? So after we got to the outer perimeter was when we took down his body armor. Okay. Yeah. And so was was he in fact shot in the chest? Uh so I believe he was, but I think the side that he was shot in was fine. Uh, he ended up having pneumonia on the other side. And so I don't think he, Adolfo not, even knew he had pneumonia. Not even related. No, he had mentioned he was coughing earlier. But yeah, when we got to the emergency room and saw that he had pneumonia, we were like, wait, what's like, this was not expected at all. Uh, and so that force knocked that blood loose. And that's what was causing the bleeding from the mouth. Uh, or just, he just started coughing more from, okay from that, but the, the force the from pneumonia the chest, was, yeah. the pneumonia was on the side opposite from mm. where I believe he was struck, wow. which was why it didn't make, cause it's, if it was on the same side, I would have said, Oh, well, maybe it's just contusion or bruising of the lung, but for it to be on the opposite side, that just didn't make sense. So he got some antibiotics for that too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that that Oak Park incident. There's been several. There's there's been a few episodes where the Oak Park incident was referenced. This is the first time mm-hmm. we've actually kind of somewhat dissected it, and we're doing it from your lifesaver perspective sure. in your role in it. And, and every we could probably Houston would have. I mean, everybody's got a different perspective of of of, uh, of this incident. What what was learned? We we you said you found out later that it was friendly fire, which it, that happens in a hot active situation. What was learned? Every every time some incident happened, there's always something that could be done better, right? Was anything learned from this that potentially that that was used for training purposes? Even uh, how you responded? Did you when you responded to the downed officer? Did you take anything away that you could have done better, like a different angle, like a different uh, position of cover, or did anything come from this from a training standpoint? Uh, So I think kind of from the medical side, uh, maybe better ways we could have evacuated him. Uh, I mean, I feel like in general things went pretty well. We got the APC up. We, you know, basically used it between us and the target. Uh, I think... The fact that we had 
one of us on each side was a really good thing that morning. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it's something that we don't do that often anymore, just because we typically only have one of us going out on these operations now. Um, so uh, definitely reinforces the idea of planning, okay, if something happens on the backside of the structure, we need to have a plan of how we're going to deal with that, either getting them towards the front, getting us to the back, and uh, kind of how to do that as safe as possible. Can you describe Hack's injuries on his leg, he, in the back of his hamstrings? He he got uh, he got hit in the hamstring area. Missed Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I mean, I didn't see him. Okay. So uh, Alex took care of Hack, uh, put a tourniquet on. Okay. Um, Saved him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing Chuck wanted me to bring up with you is that just, and you probably don't even realize this, of how many times you have helped them the people you work around and with of just the minor things not getting getting a shot like this doesn't have to be a gunshot wound how many minor injuries stitches needed that you guys take care of as opposed to when they happen that we have to go sit in baylor er for a few hours just sure. to get stitched up how you guys take care of it in-house yeah i mean that's no doubt one of the biggest things uh you know that certainly these really big events that have happened broken finger get I'm a just, lot yeah. of publicity but yeah it's a whole lot of lacerations from broken glass and smaller injuries that happen a fair amount and a big part of my role is you know obviously step one is to save lives but also to keep the team operational even when something like this happens so someone who gets a cut you know we can maybe do something really quick there in the field and get them back in the operation and let them kind of finish what's going on instead of having them come out and uh call 911 i guess yeah well or even just lower than 911 i can give you an example i had mm -hmm. a, i had a when, when i was in charge of rookies at the academy i had a recruit that had um an eye infection and i and i, I didn't want her to miss her firearms training because we were right in the middle of firearms and i didn't want her to have to be out so i called him and, and described to him and and he dropped what he was doing and helped this recruit that he didn't know and she was able to finish her her firearms training just with your help and it, there's so many stories like that that you guys do that it's incredible and that's we're talking about the big incidents here yeah. but it, there's just you know 17 years worth of just servitude yeah and and you have to remember they have a whole different job that they have to do before they even come to start helping us it's amazing yeah, it's it's. I mean, because every officer, or firefighter, is responding to anything. They don't walk away usually with not even a, a slight muscle ache, yeah. uh, laceration, or a back thrown out, or a, a sw some swelling somewhere. Or, or you know, I've been to the hell. Misty knows this. I've been to the Baylor ER with all <laughs> kinds of injuries, stuck getting stuck by needle. You know, so having you guys yeah. right there. To take care of all of that little shit like that that happens, and then you're there to save lives when the Oak Park happened, and then another shooting we're we're about to talk about. So Dr. Metzger was talking about learning points as far as medically, and and then from Oak Park tactically, we we took a lot of uh, training points on on planning warrants personnel getting getting um, injured officers off the x those were all our learning points taken from that and then in october 2007 just a year later we have another early morning federal warrant off of hollywood avenue where we had a we had a new lieutenant in our command and he was a part of a breach team on a window and as they breached that window lieutenant carlton marshall was shot in the neck and you and Alex Eastman, once again, had to go to work. So tell us that from your perspective. Sure. So that was a little bit different deal in that we weren't separated. We were both in the APC on the front of the, the house just because we didn't have an APC on the back. So uh, there wasn't a good place for one of us to stage. The team made entry. Uh, there were some parts of the operation that were that were going underway, glass breaking, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then all I heard was officer down. I never heard a gunshot. Um, it sounded like it was muffled, maybe from under a pillow or something. 
Uh, but I never heard a gunshot. So, so when I heard officer down, I figured someone twisted their ankle or uh, had some other minor injury. Uh, they So we went out of the APC, uh, and as we were kind of approaching the house, they were dragging Lieutenant Marshall uh, up the side of the house. And again, still not knowing how seriously injury he injured he was, uh, they kind of put him basically on the front corner of the house, and uh, he sort of looks up, looks like he's going to try to say something, and then just a large amount of blood comes out of his mouth. So obviously it was apparent that he was injured much more severely than first thought. Uh, pretty quickly identified a wound in his neck, just below his mandible, or his jaw. And uh, so held pressure there, and... Uh, it was very clear that he was going to need an airway, that he was going to need a tube in his trachea so that we could breathe for him because his mouth was just completely full of blood. And so I went to uh, put an airway in through his mouth, and Alex was working on starting an IV. And as I tried to look in his mouth, I just couldn't see anything. Again, it's still dark. We're, we're doing it with, like, rifle flashlights, um, and so it was pretty clear that I was not going to be able to intubate him sort of the usual way through the mouth. So our kind of next go-to in that situation is to go, uh, directly into the trachea through the neck. So we, uh, made an incision, incision put a tube in, started breathing for him. Uh, we didn't have an IV at that point, but he was unconscious, so... Um, as we started breathing for him, he started kind of waking up a little bit, uh, which was a good sign, certainly. Um, and this is going on on the side of the house. Yes. Why it was an active situation. Can you, you probably, everybody susceptible to tunnel vision, right? Do you remember anything that was going on around you? I know you were focused on, on, on the lieutenant, but do you remember anything else going on around you as far as additional shots or the behavior of the of the other op, the, the teammates uh so i definitely remember the officers that were kind of helping us out mm -hmm. uh, it was clear that there was a lot of stuff going on in the house uh, i feel like one of the uh, luxuries that i had out there was i knew that stuff was getting taken care of so i was able to just focus on what was in front of me okay i wasn't you know, I was n never at any point worried about a bad guy jumping out of the window or anything like that. Potentially could happen, though. I mean, you know, yeah. you, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Okay. Joe, you talked to an operator that was right there, um, Chuck Del Tufo. What, yep. did, what did he have to say when? Chuck sh said that he was he was in awe. He remembers at the time this y'all y'all working on somebody like as if they were in there. They were outside a window looking in of a ER surgery. It was like, give me the scalpel. And y'all were just working calmly. He could not believe how calm y'all were working on an, one of your teammates that were down in a hot situation like that. He the, he was just amazed of how just the, the calmness and the professionalism and, and y'all just doing your work. Like nothing else was going on around you that could harm y'all. Was there any moment that that you felt that you felt slightly? I know you said you knew it was being taken care of inside the house, yeah. but was there a moment of pucker factor from you when you were doing it? Not so much. Okay. I mean, I think you know, you know, bad things can happen in all of these operations. Uh, you know, not just from the target, but at any time, someone else can step out of the house next door and say, "Hey, that's my family member." and I'm going to start shooting. So you sort of always know that there's bad stuff that can happen. But again, I think having worked with the team for a while uh, made it to where that just wasn't something that I had to concern myself with. I mean, I knew, you know, if something happened, we'd deal with it. But uh, I was able to really just sort of focus on taking care of Carlton. Well, I think that probably has something to do also with just you as a person in and the calmness that you have to have to be a doctor and a surgeon and then in, and then placed into a very active 
situation like that and and um and running warrants and downed officers and uh down suspects and and you know it's had there's been had there been times where you actually had to work on a suspect that was that was down by uh, an operator yes in fact i took care of the suspect that shot and killed martin hicks wow okay i want to get into that in a minute sure. uh, i want to i want to get some more on uh on lieutenant's uh situation sure so once you got the breathing, uh, you, you got it, you got the tube in it. He started breathing. What happened after that? So, uh, we again called Dallas fire rescue. Uh, we put an IV in, we gave him some sedative because he was starting to kind of wake up a little bit, um, because he was starting to get oxygen again. Uh, and then it was just a matter of kind of waiting to, take him to the emergency department looking for other injuries kind of making sure we didn't miss any other wounds or anything like that but then there was a moment where alex and i kind of looked at each other like what just happened right how long did y'all stay on the side of that house uh, i couldn't even just, tell just a pro yeah. i mean it probably seemed like forever i mean but. it was i mean it was certainly minutes it's not like it was mm -hmm. a 30 second right um, pro i mean i it five ten minutes at what point of his stabilizing him did you did y'all make the decision we need to now it's time to evacuate? Can you describe that to the listener? So pretty much once we got that airway in, uh, we kind of assessed him. Didn't see any other major bleeding. Mm -hmm. That was when we decided to to move away. Moving forward, like what was the outcome of that incident, and how did it affect you? Sure. So uh, he went to the hospital. Uh, all of his injuries were identified, so we went in through the cricothyroid membrane, which is kind of where you do a crike. Uh, they basically took him to the OR, converted it to a regular intubation, um, identified he had a cervical spine injury, um, a couple complications from that, but was awake, talking, giving us thumbs up surprisingly soon after. I mean, I, you know, when someone gets hypoxic, when their blood oxygen levels get so low that they go unconscious, you never really know at that time how much brain function they're gonna, they've lost. And uh, so it was pretty amazing to see him waking up and pretty much back to normal. And he was paralyzed for quite some time but eventually was able to walk with a walker in the future, Yes, correct? Yes. So you guys saved his life on, on the side of that house. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's safe to say. Okay. <laughs> Be, and, being a member of SWAT, how are you able to separate friendships and work when it comes to dealing with critically or mortally injured friends? How do you, how do you cope with that? How do you deal with that? Uh, when you're dealing with it, you just don't think about it, I guess. You just go to work. Does it hit you after though? Yeah. Okay. Because most of the, like if, you, if you're working in an ER, you're, most of the people you would not know, correct? Yeah. 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 But in these situations, you're actually dealing with friends and teammates and, and we've all lost friends and our yeah. blue family. Yeah, I just want, I, I was I was Chuck actually wanted me to yeah to uh, ask you that and that's I, I can't imagine you 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 know so you're a part of two teams you're part of a your real job <laughs> you're a physician you're part of an emergency team at a very very busy hospital because because you, you worked out of Parkland right busiest in the country yeah and so. <laughs> That is a high stress level. And then on your off time here, you're over here with this team. So tell me how, the differences of being in a, within a tactical team around police officers and being around physicians, nurses. I feel like that's what has helped me do this for as long as I have uh, because they're two totally different environments. And if I did either one, I could probably see myself getting burnt out. Oh, okay. Um, whereas to be able to go in the hospital, kind of move through patients, uh, 
take care of 15, 20, 25 patients and then leave uh, and then go do PT or training or go to the shooting range. Uh, it's that variety, I think, is what keeps me going. Now, are you armed? I am. And so would you say that the mastery of weapon, weapons is um, surgical? <laughs> would, would you describe it as surgical, the concentration, the, um, the attention to detail? And does it compare to what you do in an emergency room, ER? Yes. So, yes, there's definitely a lot of similarities. Um, a lot of, you know, it's a weapon is a tool that a police officer uses out in the field exactly the same way as the blade that I use to intubate a patient. And I need to know everything about it. I need to know how it works. I need to be familiar with it. And I need to be good at it. And it's that's exactly the same as if you're going to be out on the streets with a weapon. But you're on a side of a house with a scalpel uh, cutting a, an operator's throat. The precision that, that take and the concentration that takes is I is for, hard for me to even imagine. And and so, what's your why? What's your your why on how you honed these skills to that level of concentration? Uh, why I hone my skills because I want to be ready 100% of the time. You know, I don't want something bad to happen because I'm not an expert in airways, because I'm not an expert in resuscitation. Uh, my goal is to give the people I'm taking care of their best chance of survival. And sometimes it doesn't work. You know, sometimes me giving them their best chance still isn't enough. Uh, but is that heavy for you? Because we have this expectation with physicians that you're all knowing that, you know, we go to you, but you're still human. Right. And the I can't imagine the volume that you have seen in Parkland in addition to the volume you've seen with policing. Yeah. So what's your outlet? How do you deal with that? Uh, I mean, spending time with my son. That's okay. And he's 12. My favorite. Yep. Would you say these jobs have um, given you a different outlook on parenting and love and being a human? Yeah. I mean, it's, I feel like I definitely see where parenting has gone wrong in some situations. Um, you know, it always pains me to see the mom that's upset that we're arresting their son at a dope house. Sure. Uh, and, you know, certainly not to put everything on that mother, but something went wrong in that kid's life that sort of led them down this pathway. And uh, certainly I have, you know, always wanted to make sure that I didn't make those mistakes. I want to circle back to you talked about we're actually working on a sus uh, on a suspect. Oh yeah. In in, in the in the uh, officer Nick's when he, when he got killed, we haven't really talked about that incident on um on, on this podcast, and we and I would like to. I know Jason Jark um was is is the uh, one that why the guy was still shooting and went out and and pulled officer Nick's. Uh, away from the vehicle it was a vehicle takedown he approached the vehicle it was after a car chase and uh spun out pat star was out there and uh jeremy so what what was your role and the su suspect basically barricaded himself inside inside that car and he had a if i remember correctly like a machine gun pistol he struck officer uh nix uh with and um he ultimately he died from those wounds what role did you play in that incident so we were actually driving to another warrant when that was going down so we heard it come across the radio uh i heard that there was an officer down that uh, they were going to transport him to parkland in a patrol car uh, which i knew meant that parkland probably wasn't going to get a heads up on it because usually when Dallas Fire Rescue is taking them, they'll radio in and say, hey, this is what we've got, yeah. so you can be ready for it. So 
I called Biotel and kind of gave them a heads up and tried to start kind of spinning things up so that they'd be ready for them. Uh, and then we went to the scene to, to deal with the suspect. Okay. And when you arrived at the scene, what, what, what happened once y'all got there? So we knew the suspect was barricaded in the front seat of his car. Uh, he was kind of slumped over, but did appear to be breathing. And so uh, we made some steps to uh, essentially kind of get him out of the car. I don't remember if we shot gas. I don't remember exactly what the progression was. Uh, but essentially, we got him out of the car. He was unconscious at that time. Uh, we pulled him out, and he had, I think he had, like, been shot eight times. And I thought, oh, this is not going to go well. Right. Uh, so I actually, again, kind of went to put an airway in, and he started waking up and kind of thrusting around. So I was like, okay, we're we're not going to do that right now. We're going to load him up in the ambulance and sort of get a better sense of what all's going on. And put him in the ambulance, took him to the hospital and he survived. So when you were, um, when you arrived, he was, he was basically neutralized, right? He, I mean, as far as being a, th- an active threat, cause I, I saw the body of the dash cam from that incident and all the rounds coming from inside that vehicle. And he was, it was a very aggressive scene. Yes. Right. Yes. So, but when you got there, he was, he had already been struck multiple times. Yes. And, you you worked on him mainly in the in the in the uh, the ambulance, for the most part. We pulled him out of the car, kind of just laid him on the ground, mm-hmm. and I did a quick assessment. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, at that point, there weren't any other known threats, so uh, it was a relatively safe, except for anything that he obviously would have had on him, uh, a relatively safe situation. So uh, I basically evaluated him at, at that point, tried to do the airway, and then when he started waking up, we just put him in the back of the ambulance. Wow. Was he just hitting non-critical areas? Yes. So for the listeners out there, um, this started with Northwest Patrol, and they believed um, that suspect's vehicle was a murder suspect, and they initiated chase, and the suspect spun out and turned around facing the officers yeah. in a caprice that had very dark tinted windows. So they couldn't see inside of it. Um, the Northwest Patrol did an incredible job laying rounds into that windshield. And if, when you look at that vehicle, you would think, man, they had to have good hits, headshots. Yep. And, um, but the suspect was, was laid back in the seat at that time. And when he did, when Nix went up to extract and try to um, take the suspect in custody, he tried to breach the window of, the, of that Caprice and, and, and had trouble with that. And that's when the suspect fired the round and hit Nix. Yep. And so, and like you said, Jark and uh, Jeremy Borchert mm-hmm. got Nix off the X and transported him to Parkland in a squad car. So it, we, we actually used that video as an officer rescue training video because they did such a good job of getting him off the X. The laying down fire and the, while the, while the, and them running into a very, very hot X. Yes. And in, in, uh, extracting him. Terrible, terrible deal. And I, I, we are going to uh, eventually get on some people some other people that first responded to that and 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 get their story and perspective of that uh it was terrible uh loss of life for dpd oh yeah and so we've covered a lot of tactical that tactical piece on your fellowship but you've also handled ebola covid and so does that cover another piece of it and what was that piece again so well so the there's a lot of this idea of tactical medicine, this operational medical support. Uh, the within the law enforcement side, we kind of expand into other ways that we can help the department. So dealing with pandemics, dealing with you know there was a MRSA outbreak in one of the gyms, uh, just kind of sort of trying to offer our expertise however we can help the department, not just out in the field on operations. Do you remember Ebola? Yes. Okay. And so tell us a little bit about that. Tell our listeners, because they they may not even remember it, a lot of our young officers. So one of the issues was we had a gentleman here from Africa um, who had Ebola, and the 
you know, one of the issues became, well, you know, how worried about it do we need to be? And, you know, he was, I believe had an order, but at least was directed to isolate and the, and then some nurses also got it. And, uh, the questions became, well, you know, how do we as officers, like, what do we do if he decides to go to the mall? Um, and so really just kind of working with the department on dealing with, um, uh, how to respond to situations like that. Well, everybody's heard of COVID. Ebola, right? And, and yes. I remember hearing about Ebola. What? Damn! I, I saw right. that movie Outbreak with Dustin Hoffman. I mean, you know, it was <laughs> yes. with a little with a monkey with the the beard, you know, and that's terrifying because you know, usually when you hear about Ebola, you think, well, this you're not going to survive this. Is this is this is it? And to hear that it was in our city, behind the scenes, were, were you pretty concerned with the outbreak? From you, from a, looking at it from a medical standpoint, with your expertise, a little bit. I don't know that I would say pretty concerned. Uh, way more concerned about COVID. Yeah, we're gonna get into that. I want. <laughs> I, I really want to dig into that. Um, you know, Ebola is. Uh, it's very communicable, uh, very easy to spread, and uh, can be deadly. Uh, in the United States, we are lucky to have a lot of resources that they don't have. Yeah, and its origin in yeah. Africa. Yeah. So, uh, I think you know our we we would expect our survival to be higher, but uh, still recognizing that it was deadly and not something to mess with. And definitely didn't want it to sp- like exactly. spread, especially the first responders, because you can lock down all you can, you can avoid people all you want. First responders cannot lock down, and we can't. Exactly. We have to. We have to. <laughs> contact folks yes i think diseases are m- more scary than an armed suspect <laughs> oh yeah especially the unknown diseases like the sure. covid yeah. and and then it, you know what are some of the effects of ebola to describe like if you're dying from ebola what, what what's going on with you physically so really bad diarrhea mm. vomiting and you just can't keep fluids inside your body and so people basically dehydrate and die Wow. Yeah, that's that sounds like some people's Saturday nights. <laughs> the, the, the Cowboys Red River. Um wanna get into COVID. You I, I I could not wait to get on this topic with you because when it happened, it was a s it was a form of SARS, right? It was a, the is it called isn't this called SARS V two? SARS CoV Co- Co- yes. two. So, so whenever this happened, can you Tell the listener, because you were probably in a lot of meetings when this first hit, and of how, I mean, really terrified everybody was as a city and, and the leaders that didn't have the expertise, and you're sitting there trying to explain explain to the lay person, and you're scared yourself. Yeah. So the big issue with coronavirus, COVID, was we just didn't know really anything about it you know we early on we didn't know exactly how it was spread we didn't know how dangerous it was we didn't know what the pattern was going to be like within the community you know we saw what was happening overseas um, and then we started seeing what was happening like in new york city and it was just something that we just you know i like to know what i'm dealing with so when I'm dealing with a heart attack, you know, I know a lot about it and how to treat it and what to expect. But we just didn't have that with COVID. And well, from from a medical st- from a medical expert like yourself, you like to know things. And when unknowns pop up like this, I mean, law enforcement we deal with unknowns every time we approach a door. Right. But how what was going through your mind? You had to be somewhat calm. And especially assisting the, the police department, who I'm sure we were ter- we, we're not experts in the medical field. What were you thinking at that time? So it was just a matter of, I think, trying to do what we felt was the right steps, take the right steps, do the right things. And again, we we didn't know exactly what that was, so we were just sort of making best guesses based on the limited information we had. Uh, and in the end, 
some of it was good in the end some of it wasn't it was either useless not helpful or could have been actually harmful did it Um, overwhelm parkland so we had a lot of covid patients but our total volume dropped people just stopped coming to the emergency department Okay. So our total ED volume dropped by, I think, around 20% or so. Is that wow. because of the lockdown? Because people were just staying, not going out? And, yes. And, okay. and I think there was a lot of fear. People were yeah. afraid to come to the hospital because they knew we had it. I mean, we were certainly seeing a lot of COVID and taking care of it every day. We tried to keep it separate from the patients who didn't have COVID, but that was tough. I mean, we identified a lot of people with COVID who didn't have any symptoms. And a lot of people just probably thought that even a little bit to this day, people get sick with a sniffles or they get a fever. There's probably a fleeting thought that do I have COVID as opposed to a flu? Seemed like the flu has gone away since, since this has been going the last two years, you know, Um, driving into Dallas, during the initial lockdown and the city lockdowns, it was like a two week, right? Were you part of those those conversations as far as locking down the city? Because, you know, the, the, the PD didn't stop. We had to keep coming oh, in. Yeah. Yes, uh, part of those conversations. Okay. Driving into the city, it, it was like that movie, I Am Legend. Will Smith. I mean, really, there was crazy. There was like no traffic at, at no time of day. In the morning. Yeah. Yeah. At even 5 p.m. Yep. Going home. Yeah. It was scary, eerie. Yes. There was none of those creatures, though. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. I would have had to get a German Shepherd like he had. <laughs> cool German Shepherd, by the way. Um, when did you first start hearing about this virus? I remember when I did, and it was like a little news blurb, and I kind of just blew it off. Did, when you first started hearing about it, did what were, what were your initial thoughts about this? So my initial thoughts was it was probably uh, much ado about nothing. Yeah. Uh, just, I mean, you know, obviously you knew it was a virus. We had been through like the Middle Eastern respiratory virus. Uh, and that ended up, you know, that was, again, kind of something that we heard about and were kind of worried about, but didn't really pan out here in the United States. It's interesting that you had that response. I mean, because I, I had that response, but I'm just a dumbass. I mean, I what you know, I, and they hear you. The, an expert and you're in this field and you're just kind of like, yeah, that ain't nothing. I mean, most people, that's how most people thought. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously we, as we got more information and certainly as we saw what was starting to happen on our own soil. Right. That all quickly changed. And especially up in New York. I think right. New York was hit hardest in the beginning, right? They right. were the kind of the ground zero for the, the major outbreaks. Yes. You know? Yeah. As the plan unfolded, can you kind of just can you describe your role? And it was ever evolving. Uh, can you describe what you were doing at this time, as far as uh, assisting the PD in the city? Sure. So, uh, within the police department, you know, obviously our big question was how do we keep the department functioning? If you know we had an entire station taken out with people who had COVID, you know that would be devastating. So. How do we decide, you know, we also can't isolate 100% from everything. Um, so h- how do we kind of find a balance to allow people to work and yet try to protect them and keep them safe? And so pretty early on, uh, either Alex or, or I was getting called for any of the questions, questions whether or not to test an officer, questions of what to do. You know, with a positive test, who needs, who else needs to isolate? You know, what does that officer need to do? And um, and then for some of our officers that ended up in the hospital, kind of trying to liaison and and you were still dealing with the whole all the uh, Parkland, question, Parkland all the questions that was coming from the hospital, right? Yes, and your own personal fears, right? That, was there ever a point that you felt a little overwhelmed with all this? Uh, not in particular. I don't okay. remember. All right. I'd have been, yeah, I'd have probably wanted um, to oscillate and not pick up the phone, but yeah, <laughs> that's, that's impressive. I mean, doc. It, there, there was definitely a lot of phone calls, but 
I mean, it's. But you only knew what you. I mean, the, in in that, what was going on initially, in the way the uh, since more information, more research has come out, it's not how it is now. Right, uh, and a lot of it is the virus has changed. The Omicron variant that we're dealing with now is different than what we saw in 2020. What's your thoughts on, um, or your opinion on vaccinations? Uh, 100% for them. So tell our listeners why. Because I think that's going to be the only way, and I think that has done a lot to get us into the position we're in now. Uh, and I think that's going to be the only way to protect ourselves in the future. Uh, one of the big issues with this virus is that you know we've seen it mutate, and the more of the virus you have in the community, whether they're sick enough and coming to the hospital and dying or not, the more of it you have out in the community, the more chance of it mutating into potentially something that could be worse. And we could kind of start seeing more deaths again than what we're seeing right now. What, what part of the, of the country's response, whether, whether it was lack of um, pharmaceuticals, masks, gloves, what part, what was the most shocking to you that we we were not prepared for as a country with this? I feel like probably medical supplies. Yeah. Uh, being concerned about our ability in the hospital to have the equipment that we need to protect ourselves. I had never really considered or never imagined I would have to worry about that here in the United States. Do you, do you think that we, I mean, after every major incident in our history, right, whether it was 9-11, people flying planes in the building, we we learn from that, right? You know, there's been no more planes crashing in the building since then. We, uh, TSA, we, we have all these uh, guidelines and all these restrictions, and we have this protocol now. Do you feel that after, and we're still learning about this, right? We're still adapting and and. Uh, and, and t- not even getting into the political side of all this. Do you feel that we're better off now as a country to deal with something like this if another, if this mutates into something else or worse? I think so. I think we've learned a lot of lessons. We've had a lot of vulnerabilities identified. Uh, and I think that's going to make us, it has made us stronger now and is going to continue to make us stronger in the future. What do you feel like helped our fire, our police stay the most safe during COVID? Was it was it the vaccinations? Was it the mask? Was it the gloves? What do you feel like was the most important piece? Uh, I feel like a lot was probably the staying at home. Oh, okay. Uh, I think that certainly I think the mask masking has been huge. Uh, I think, you know, as mentioned before, flu was essentially not a thing during the peak of COVID. This last season, we saw a decent amount of flu, not not as much as normal. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's certainly obvious that all of these measures kind of work together to prevent the spread of a lot of stuff. You were right in the mix. Do you, do you feel like COVID changed your career in any way? I don't think, I mean, it's a story to tell, but... I don't think, I mean, you know, I've, I've certainly learned my lessons about certain things, uh, but I mean, I do that every day. So, as med- as medicine and technology changes, yeah, right, you, right. yeah, wow, well, and just it, experiences and yeah, you know. and this is just another major flashpoint in your life as your medical career. Yes, okay. yeah, I mean, yeah. Could you talk about comorbidities when it comes to this and the? the deaths that have happened, what percentage as far as involved comorbidities with, with the, the patients? So comorbidities are definitely huge. Uh, when we look at the people who died, you know, a large number of them were overweight, had diabetes, uh, or extremes of age. Yeah. We, we do a lot of promotion for, and a lot of pushing, uh, vaccines and, and I, I've been vaccinated. I've been, I've been, uh, I've had my second shot. I've had a, I want them all. Give me a cocktail, just a cocktail. I'll take them all, put them all in one martini glass. I'll take them. But also we need to do a better job of promoting physical fitness 
and and, and, uh, and everybody and pushing that to be physically stronger and uh, and just overall healthy to, to, to combat these kind of viruses. Do you believe that? Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, certainly one of the things with this virus is we've seen young, otherwise healthy people die from it. Uh, but when you look at the numbers, it's your chances are better if you're. We're probably exposed physically. a lot of uh, of uh, comorbidities that the people didn't they weren't aware of, right? Because I've I've heard a lot of there was a lot of deaths that were contributed to COVID, but it was actually there was much more serious diseases or in some cases injuries that that. Uh, was the initial cause yeah i mean it's certainly it's been tough uh and we knew this from the beginning as as we're figuring out how we diagnose someone you know they are having a heart attack and they have covid and covid doesn't cause heart attacks so to speak but it can make you more hypercoagulable make your blood more prone to clotting Mm -hmm. which can make you more prone to heart attacks strokes that kind of stuff so uh, is that a COVID death or is it completely unrelated? I mean, it's like COVID would latch on to whatever ailment you already had and just expose it, right? And and magnify it and and, and make you die from it. Okay, could yeah, or it could be unrelated. Like like I say, you know, we have people who are asymptomatic who test positive for COVID. And we tested them because they're getting a colonoscopy. Yeah no other symptoms and they're COVID positive. So, uh, it's, there's still so many unknowns. Do you, with two, over two years in, where do you see, do you see us ever getting back to somewhat <laughs> normal? I mean, we just I mean, you now fly with, without mask, you know, but, but do you see us ever getting back to, uh, what we believe prior to 20, uh, March of 2020, in a normal state i can definitively say i don't know i mean going back an honest answer (laughs) going back to like april 2020 we have all these smart people doing these predictive graphs that show it peaking and then show it dropping off and by july august it's gone when obviously that didn't happen no when a lot of those smart people that early on there were so there's so many things we look back now and this is with anything you look back and you pick it apart and you have the, we have the luxury of that now of two years of data right we can look at it and say that that shit that was totally wrong that wasn't yep. a good practice so that wasn't a good approach but i didn't know this about you but um i read on your your resume that you are a part of our dallas underwater recovery dive team so yes. h- how many guys do we have on our undercover or our, our underwater recovery dive team. Ooh, uh, probably twenty. And so, do you actually team. get in the scuba suit? I do. Okay, so yeah. what's your role as a, a physician? So, certainly, my big role is to be there to provide medical support, either if someone gets injured. Um, you know, it, things like drowning is a lot less of a concern, kind of in our area. We're not doing a lot of. 100 foot deep recoveries or anything like that uh but it's the team gets into really dirty really nasty water with really bad stuff in it so um kind of just being there to help and provide medical assistance as best i can and then i mean i enjoy it so it's something that you know i go through all the other training i've gotten all the other certifications uh, the rescue dri- diver, full face mask, dry suit, all that kind of stuff. Once again, this is something extra, correct? <laughs> yes. Okay, so you have your real job, <laughs> your white coat job, and then you're our SWAT physician, and are you now you're responding to these dive callouts? Is that correct? Yes. Uh, I, since COVID, unfortunately, I have not been out to much of the stuff with the dive team just because of kind of my role at Parkland now and. Uh, what we're doing with the SWAT team, but certainly more so, and would like to be able to step back in and do more of it. Can Can you tell us one of uh, one of these dive incidents that might stick out in your head, a story? Because I, I think a lot of our listeners have no idea mm. 
the nastiness that these guys are going into. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, it, you know, I didn't realize we had so many bodies of water within the city. So, you know, they're getting into these little tiny ponds behind a apartment complex. And uh, obviously things like White Rock and some of our bigger bodies of water. And it's, so the main goal of the team is to either recover evidence so looking for guns, laptops, whatever, when they get here that, you know, a suspect has thrown something into the water uh, or to do body recoveries. And uh, that's something that uh, certainly I wasn't planning on doing when I started all this. But the, the dive team, they go out and, they, and there's a lot of bodies they found, like uh, dead bodies that are d- heavily decomposed down into the in these bodies of water, right? Yes. Yeah. And. <laughs> What risk do some of these divers have of of of, of extracting these decomposed bodies? Yeah. So there's definitely risks of infections. Um, there's certainly a lot of steps to try to mitigate that as much as much as possible. So uh, most of the stuff that the team does is in a dry suit. So they're not actually contacting the water. They've got a full face mask yeah. um, and are kind of doing everything they can to separate themselves from the water. You have so much training, <laughs> different hats. <laughs> are you, are you just, uh, you're like, you seem to be like one and, and all, most medical person, you're addicted to training because training that's very important to you. Clearly. Why do you have so many interests? Is that, is that, is that motivate you to, I mean, it's at the end, at the end of, Doc, Dr. Metzger's life, you yeah. you can say that there's not much you haven't done that you've wanted to do, right? Yeah. So certainly I don't want any regrets. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. Like when I learn about something that seems like that'd be fun, I kind of jump in with both feet. Uh, I think probably the biggest thing is I have this sort of uh, it's kind of colloquial, but a thirst for knowledge. Like I just want to know everything about everything. And uh, I mean that. That's impressive though. I mean, no, really that's, that's amazing. Do you take those diving skills? Have you used them for something fun? Oh yes. So uh started out actually went through dive team training to, or went through diving certification with the goal of being on the team, uh, but needed to get some experience first. So did some, went through the training, did some recreational diving, uh, and then joined the team. And that's really kind of where the training started. Uh, but it's even my recreational diving is so much more fun now because I'm so much more comfortable in the water and able to, respond to whatever i need to respond to so what's your favorite place you've 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 dove in Mm. for recreation uh so there's a cenote in mexico which is a big like limestone collapsed cave system cool with the clearest water i've ever seen and you're you know you as you get back into the caves it's pitch black and all you have is your flashlight and you're going through these little tiny holes and then all of a sudden you're in this big cavern and it was oh that's, amazing. that's my favorite yeah and then professionally what is the worst mm-hmm. body of water you've seen our guys or that you've been in in the city of dallas <laughs> or late to walk in <laughs> <laughs> uh i mean it's they're all pretty bad they're all three inches of visibility uh weight rock white rock is probably my least favorite to be in really yeah how come uh, it just feels dirty. Yeah. <laughs> it feels just, dirty. Yeah. <laughs> it's a slime. Just, just, yeah. <laughs> wow. So I love being on it, but hats off to so our dive inside. team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. They're they're awesome. Brandon Thompson. I, I, he I think he's still on the dive team. Yeah. But yeah. He he just promoted. Um, he would tell me about some of the. He got cut by a. Uh, it was like a car antenna of a submerged vehicle, and it. And it and went through a seat, cutting pretty good, and it, yeah, he got infected. That's yeah, that's it's. I mean, disgusting. it's a. It, 
it's a very dangerous environment. You know, you're down there, you're on you're working on a car, trying to recover a car. And, yeah. you know, if it shifts and pins you, what do you do? You know, obviously we have plans for that kind of stuff, but it's, and there's all, you know, obviously all sorts of broken glass and trash and toxins. And, well, have, have you seen them nasty. recover evidence? Do they, do they often find what they're looking for? Uh, I don't know what the percentage is. Uh, a lot of times it's a question of that what they're looking for is actually even out there for the wild goose chase. Um, cause a lot of the, the information that we get is kind of shady, uh, bodies get found. Sure. So when we're looking for bodies, do you feel like in your professional opinion, they have the equipment needed to do that job? I do. They've gotten a lot of support from other agencies. Uh, so they've got a lot of really cool toys. Um, I think there's some other things that they could use, uh, but they've definitely gotten a lot of support. How many are on the team? Do you know? I mean, roughly. I know it's uh, people I come and go. I say it was probably like 20. Oh, okay. I have the last training order. I could look that up. Of all the training that you've, you've, you've gotten, um, what was the most challenging to you? As far as like the the tactical training, the firearm training, the uh, the dive team, we're not including medical school, right? No, I'm not. I can't. You know, I can't synchronize swimming training. The, the DPD put you to that at all? No. We, Chief Garcia, we need a synchronized Are there swimming openings? team. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was the most challenging, physically, mentally, for you? And I'm not even asking about medical school. Uh, I mean, definitely, kind of the police academy part. You know, studying for. Uh, I believe at that point it might have still been called TECLIOS, but the, basically the TECL, the state test. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, you know, that, that's book work and that's a lot of, I think one of the reasons I struggled with that probably even more than medical school was because that wasn't something that I could make any kind of inferences from. You know, that was a lot of sort of memorization yeah absolutely and whereas with medical school you can kind of you know you know a little bit about this a little bit about this so you can kind of understand how pieces fit together and there's a practical application you can ultimately do right yeah okay that's interesting yeah i never thought of that would you say you've you've taken a lot of tests so would you say those tco tests are kind of tricky yes (laughs) yeah (laughs) yep the and like the level of i don't feel so dumb anymore (laughs) The, the level of knowledge that you have to have, you know, it, and a lot of it doesn't really make sense. Like, do I need to know that this offense is a class B misdemeanor? No. Yeah. When that's something that I can look up and that's an offense that me and my role, I'm never going to put on somebody. So sure. a lot of it is, st- and I get that, you know, you kind of need to know everything about texas state law and and there's a chance you could have a deadly force confrontation though no doubt and that's 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 a legality you need to and that's yes when an officer that we have to go through that rolodex in our mind weigh legality risk you know and and yeah yeah and that's i mean that's definitely the the kind of stuff that that certainly should be pounded into you before you take the test and when you take the test and fascinating I didn't think that he would find that challenging. No, I didn't either. I didn't, <laughs> be just yeah. easy, easy breezy. Yeah. I feel better, though, about me. Yeah. <laughs> Doc, you responded July 7th. And, and we've, we've had um, guests on here that were very important role, that played very important roles in, in that incident. But we've never talked to anybody about the medical perspective of responding to such a big incident. Sure. So, uh, from my side, so I got a notification that there were multiple officers shot downtown. Um, and the initial plan was to actually head towards headquarters, uh, to stage. And then we were going to all sort of move in. But, um, as I started getting closer to downtown, there were, a lot of reports of kind of different locations that the shooter was in, that there was potentially more than one shooter. Uh, Certainly with these situations 
communication is always very challenging and the information you get is um, sometimes in direct conflict with other information that you have. So uh, I made the decision to divert downtown. Um, There was a park kind of across from a parking garage where they thought he was in. Uh, I saw some officers kind of huddled behind a car. So I pulled up there, um, got my gear out and was just trying to kind of get a lay of the land, figure out where the suspect was. Um, and then it was sort of like nothing was happening there. And so, and it was apparent that the suspect wasn't kind of in the immediate vicinity. So, uh, I actually went back in to my vehicle and started heading around towards that parking garage. And that's when I was, I don't remember if it was on the radio or how I heard that he was in the El Centro college. So, uh, kind of made my way that direction. What was going through your mind when you were hearing about all the down officers and it was still a very active, hot situation? At that time, I remember there was information out there that there was multiple people, that it was an organized, like a, basically a terrorist act. Right. What, what was going through your mind as far as, uh, other than just knowing you needed to be a place to help save as many lives as you can, what else was going through your mind responding to the event like this? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, certainly within law enforcement, you're – one of your primary goals is to deal with the threat. Um, And I think the more people you have that you're recognizing, that's not my primary role. That's not why I'm out there, but um, figuring out where the threat was and being ready if you've got to deal with the threat Uh, while also trying to be cognizant of whether or not there was a better place for me to be. Right. In all that chaos. Right. So when you responded to the scene, can you describe what what you saw and where you went? So uh, when I got to El Centro, uh, there were already a lot of officers on the first floor. And um, and kind of talking to the team, it sounded like he was in the stairwell and they had or had gone up that stairwell and they had him pretty well cornered by the time I got into the college. What was going on inside the college on that first floor when you got there? Like, was there, were there people there? Were there other uh, officers there? All officers. They okay. had evacuated everyone from the first floor. There was still a group of people up on the third floor that didn't get evacuated until probably a couple hours into the scenario. Okay. Did you, it, while you were on that first floor, did you treat any in, any officers for injuries that were on that first floor? So I did not. By the time I got on scene, all the officers had, all the injured officers had been evacuated. At that time, were you aware of what happened? How many? How much damage that shooter had done? Uh, I knew there were several fatalities. I didn't have a solid number. Hmm. Like, you know, it's it's hard for me. I, mean, I wasn't I wasn't there. I lost a very good friend. But it's you being there, uh, and were you getting any kind of intel? Were you hearing any of the plan that was going up on that second floor from where you were? Yes. Can yeah. you can you we describe that kind of staying up on it? I mean, it was. Uh, so from my understanding, basically the chief had made a directive to kind of think outside of the box and figure out a way to end this and, uh, gave a news briefing and the team kind of came up with an out of the box plan to end the situation. The the use of the robot. Yes. With more and more of these incidents happening around, our nation. What's your stance on on these high powered weapons? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to put people on the spot. Yeah. But I'm I'm curious. I yeah. mean, you you firsthand see the damage that these weapons do, and so I'm curious how you look at it from your yeah. eyes. Uh, I worry that. A legal approach isn't enough. So just outlawing them isn't going to fix it. I mean, it's, and it, I think part of it is the same thing that, you know, murder is against the law. Sure. It still happens. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think there's no doubt it's easier with weapons like this, with the devastating power they have, the accuracy they have 200, 300 yards out. Um, but I don't think that's going to be the fix. I, I mean, I think getting to 
the root of mental illness and I'm glad you mentioned that because mm-hmm. you, you've spent many years teaching mental health to officers, correct? Yes. So in your opinion, is this a mental health issue or is this a weapon issue or is it a combination? Uh, on some level, it's a combination, but I think until we solve the mental health issue, I don't think we're going to get to the bottom of it. Uh, I mean, even if we outlawed all guns, I think you're still going to have bad attacks, maybe not quite to the level that we have now, um, just because it's a whole lot harder to suddenly kill 19 people with a knife. Unless you're in a truck that can plow through a crowd. Sure. Yep. And we've seen a rise, we've seen a rise in that too. Yes. It, it, it really becomes the mean, the guns are just the means, right? right? It's, if you have, if, if somebody has the will to want to cause that much damage and they can plan it however they want and they, they sometimes we'll find a way yes right and that's you can take you can out you could ban and outlaw whatever weapon and there are laws against certain people having weapons now right and misty and i have arrested several of them that they at the time they were not supposed to have a handgun you can you can do a lot of damage with a handgun it's not all just the high-powered rifles absolutely yep i mean you see it firsthand yes i'm curious how your gear has changed since when you started this program to now it's gotten a lot lighter <laughs> you mean <laughs> tired that? of carrying around a bunch of unnecessary <laughs> so what did you down and what did you add what is what is a key piece of equipment that you got rid of that was not useful and then a key piece of equipment that is you can't live without uh so by far the the biggest i think piece of equipment that i feel like any of us are going to save a life with is a tourniquet so every officer should have a tourniquet on them on them, on their person, anytime they're out on the streets. Um, you know, I mentioned kind of giving people their best chance. There's a lot of stuff that you're not going to save. Um, I don't, you know, if Mark Nix was shot in the parking lot of a hospital and he got immediate medical care, he probably would have still died. So, uh, Why is that? Where where were his key injuries? Uh, it was in, I believe it was in the subclavian artery. So kind of up high uh, in a place that's hard to get to. Sure. Is there a piece of equipment that you started out with that you don't use now? Um, I think just kind of less in general. Uh, and I keep a lot of stuff in my vehicle. So I'm taking a lot of it less, like actually out with me. Uh, so... I certainly, unlike barricaded persons, I don't take my defibrillator with me because the okay. likelihood of me needing that is low. It's in my vehicle. It's right there. Uh, but I don't carry it with me into an apartment complex. Do you carry your equipment? Uh, is it a backpack or is it a handheld? So basically two backpacks. Um, one of them is, uh, both of them are generally just carried by the handle, but they're kind of built as backpacks and made with a bunch of ways to kind of make them more versatile, versatile, like ways to hang them off the side of the APC or make them accessible. Very cool. It's evolution with everything. I mean, it's, right. whether it's technology yeah. or just small things of where to hang a bag to make it less stress on your body, right? Yep. And, and more accessible. Yep. That's... And it's a lot of, really a lot of networking. I think that's how, that's how we learn kind of better ways to do stuff. You know, I have only been on a few incidents, but when you look at everyone who's been on incidents within the country in this setting, as well as overseas in a military setting, people kind of learn new ways to carry stuff and different equipment and things that work and things that don't. And so kind of networking and learning from all of that stuff, no doubt has kind of helped me do my job better. And finding the best practice to do that. It's right. like even in the medical field, y'all do exactly. the same. Y'all get your yep. head, your smart heads together, and you put together the most efficient and the best plan possible, right? Yep. Out of both jobs, what's the most fun? Oh, most fun is definitely the law enforcement side. Why? Outside, kind of interacting with more people, I guess. You know, in 
certainly in the hospital, you're interacting with colleagues, you're interacting with nurses, you're interacting with patients, but uh, being out in the public is different. Doctor, are you gravitate to danger and unknown? <laughs> no, I'm because because I'm listening to your cave, you know the your dive in and then gear towards the policing side because in a sterile hospital environment in an ER, you yeah. you know what you got when you're on the side of a house with a downed officer. There's a lot unknown. Um, I think there's no doubt. I like adrenaline, mm-hmm. so that's probably part of it. Uh, I am, you know, I'm never been worried about dying. Uh, I am much more worried about not living a full life. And so everyone dies at some point. And so what about CJ, your son, if he came to Mm. you and he said, dad, should it be a doctor or should it be a cop? Mm. (laughs) What's your answer? (laughs) Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, I think he needs to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Invest in uh, crypto. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's tough, you know, even in the time that, from the time I got sworn until now, policing has changed. Absolutely. Uh, medicine has changed. You know, we just had a physician get killed uh, not too long ago. So it's, I don't know. Uh, I mean, really, it all has to do with doing something that you're you enjoy and you're happy with. Because if it's not that, then you shouldn't be doing it, and it won't be a good life. It won't be a fulfilled life, right? Right. You're passing down legacy with a son, and I can't mm-hmm. imagine how many police officers, physicians that you have actually taught and made their jobs better. What's next for you? I don't know yet. I've, uh, you know, I've been asked kind of even that whole, like, you know, where do you see yourself in the next five years? No idea. Uh, And I feel like, I mean, five years ago, 10 years ago, I never would have seen myself here 15 years ago. Like, it's, I don't know. It depends on what opportunities open up. and And you'll master it. Yeah, I'll and, try. <laughs> and what you're so open to, I mean, you, whatever is going to challenge you, that's your next big thing, yeah. right? Yeah, definitely. I'm sure you're seeking it. Give our listeners, our young listeners, we always ask this, um, a piece of advice as they're starting their careers, whether they're a physician or whether they're a police officer. Give them something from your, from that brain of yours. Hmm. Uh, I mean, I guess the biggest thing. One, you have to love what you're doing. Uh, And I think if you love what you're doing, it makes it easier to put your head down and do the work. And if you're not going to commit to that, you're not going to put your head down and do the work, then you need to do something else. That's great advice. Thank you for your blue-collar mentality, even in a white coat. (laughs) It's it's impressive. it's, It's inspiring. And you've been such... A wonderful asset to our department. It's amazing. Thank you. It's been an honor. Doc, thank you for being here. Take, I know you're a super busy no. <laughs> individual. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll let you get back to your, your dive in and, and uh, <laughs> caves and saving lives. I can't thank you enough for coming on here and, uh, and educating our listeners on what you do. And Misty and I can't thank you enough for keeping us safe and protect them, this department and city. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hey, brother, hey, sister, I'll never give up on you. Hey, Mrs., hey, mister, I'll see this all the way through. No matter how far the sun is you heavy when the going gets tough 
I'll be your shoulder. Together we'll run up from the bottom. Yeah, we'll rise above. Hey brother, hey sister, I'll never give up on you. Hey Mrs. A. I'll never give up on you.